Welcome to Downtown Sports. My name is Downtown Stephen Brown. And in today's video, guys, it's the series where I don't provide the content. Sometimes you guys do, but for the most part, hopefully not. Reacting to armchair GMs on Cap Friendly. This is just an absolute gold mine if you've never done it before. But before we jump into those armchair GMs, I want to show kind of a skeleton of what next year's Leaf team could possibly look like. And this has Timothy Lilligren there and also Nick Robertson. Not 100% sure of what to expect from those two players. I would like to see them leaned upon a little bit, but I would also like to see the Leafs add players to make sure that they're not playing too high up in the lineup. This also has Kerfoot here. This also has Justin Hall here. You're more than likely going to lose one of them to the Seattle expansion draft, um, and you may figure out that you can't afford the other. So maybe both of those guys are gone. So if Hall is the guy to go, you got $12 million to work with to do something with this team. So let's take a look at the armchair GMs. I'm seeing a lot of these revolve around trading for Matthew to Chuck. Um, so let's just take a look at the Calgary Flames' cap friendly page. I guess his contract is expiring at the end of next season. And if we're taking a look here, um, his salary does jump up to $9 million in the final year of that deal. But again, he's just 23 years old. He's going to be 24 um, this December. It's just, this is not a type of player that you trade. Um, especially with the way that the NHL is kind of leaning. If you're watching the playoffs, you need players like Matthew Tuchuk to win in the playoffs. Calgary would just be absolutely crazy to trade this guy. Just kind of spitballing here. There are no official rumors tying the Leafs and the Flames together, but um, if the Leafs do pursue Dougie Hamilton, and I will leave that video linked above the screen if you're interested in checking that out, um, would the Flames be interested in a Morgan Riley, Johnny Goudreau kind of swap? I still like my idea that I floated in the previous video of going after a guy like Thomas Tatar in free agency. The Montreal Canadiens have been healthy scratching on these playoffs, but I don't think that has anything to do with him being bad. I just don't think that he fits the type of game that the Canadians are trying to play right now in the playoffs. Uh, the type of game that they need to play in order to win, and that's okay. That's okay. Certain players just don't fit with certain teams. They've gone through a couple of different coaching changes, and it's easy to see how maybe he's fallen out of favor there. But this is a good player who's capable of generating offense and capable of generating um, things in transition. Um, and the Toronto Maple Leafs need help scoring goals. They need offensive help. They're losing a guy like Zach Hyman more than likely. Um, and because Montreal's absolutely soaring his value, by healthy scratching him in the playoffs and continuing to win, he may be available on a one or two year deal at a reasonable rate. I always like clicking on the ones that say, is this realistic? Because nine out of 10 times, you just know that they're not going to be. And Christian Dvorak going to the Toronto Maple Leafs here, that's interesting. We talked about Christian Dvorak as being one of the possible players that uh, Chris Johnston possibly hinted at at the end of one of the Steve Dangle podcast episodes where he said the Leafs could be interested in a big name player who is playing on a US based team that did not make the playoffs this year at all and who has multiple years left on their deal. That's specific without being specific at the same time. And we talked about Dvorak not necessarily having the greatest of years last season, but the Coyotes as a whole were kind of a mess last year too. But Christian Dvorak has had success in the past and especially the last two seasons on the power play, which is noteworthy. And when you're looking at a guy like Dvorak on the power play, if you just watch highlight reels of him scoring goals, he scores a lot of tips and deflections, which is something that the Leafs have been missing ever since James Van Riemsdyk left. But he also takes a lot of his shots on the power play over his career right in front of the net. And if the Leafs are maybe looking to switch things up with their power play and maybe utilize John Tavares a little further out for his shot or William Nylander a little further out for his shot you're going to need a new net front guy there and this is someone who does play center and who does win face-offs at a margin that you would care about and as for the reason why he could be on the move is that if you're looking at the way that his contract is structured um the amount of money that he makes goes up from here on out and if you're looking at a guy like Kerfoot if the Leafs were to make this trade after whenever they pay out his signing bonus he would only be owed $3.45 million over the next two seasons or $1.725 million a year in actual money. And if you're a team like the Coyotes, that is attractive. You're saving money and you're still getting a good player. They're getting more of a playmaker, a sandpaper type player who can provide some defensive value. And the Leafs are getting someone who can help their power play and score some goals, which is 
been the problem the last two seasons in the playoffs. As for the rest of that trade, SDA and a first on top of Kerfoot I think is a bit steep. It really does just depend how much the Coyotes value saving money because Kerfoot, like I said, has value on his own. Um, but if you're factoring in um, the value of that contract, especially if they wait until after they pay out his signing bonus for this upcoming season, that has value. The ability to save money has value in trades. So maybe it's SDA and a prospect who's similar to him. And as I've mentioned before, I think that the Leafs try to make up for the fact that they don't have very many picks over the next couple of drafts by signing overage players that get passed up on in this year's draft. And because of that, it would make moving on from a couple of prospects in their system already in a trade for a player like Christian Dvorak a bit easier to swallow because the overage players are older, they're further along in their development, um, so you can afford to trade some prospects at that point. And when I'm talking about undrafted free agents, think of a guy like Pavel Gogula. We actually did a video on him when the Leafs signed him, and I'll leave that linked above the screen if you're interested in watching that uh, prospect profile, but he's six foot one, 180 pounds. He's 21 years old. He's described as a dexterous puck carrier um, who's able to play the puck uh, close within defenders' feet, and he has an unbelievable shot. Um, his stock suffered from defensive issues and compete issues, but the Leafs signed him. They played him with the Marlies in the back half of this season, and if you follow them, this guy could just not stop scoring with 12 points in 13 games. So you may say boo-hoo to the idea of hoping that you get any uh, decent prospects by just signing guys who uh, were passed over in a couple of drafts, but you look at a guy like Pavel Gogolev and that's some pretty good value. I like using this series as a springboard for talking points because while it may not be too realistic that the Flames look the trade to Chuck, is there anything else there that may make sense? Um, Click on another one and it talks about Christian Dvorak and um, that led us through to the conversation about the draft and Pavel Gogolev and it's just, it's interesting um, the rabbit holes that you can go down. But I got to about page five and there was nothing interesting, nothing more. Um, it was just more of the same, really. And I think the problem is, is that no one really knows what to do with the team right now, right? Like you can see the cap space in the corner. And then maybe they move on from a guy like Engvall. Okay, that's some more cap space. Maybe it makes sense to trade a guy like Kerfoot. Okay, that's even more cap space. And then you can look at free agents, which we did. And I'll leave that video linked above the screen as well. Uh, some smart trades maybe that they can make. All right, fine. That's encouraging and stuff like that. You see guys like Lilligren and Sandine and Robertson. And those are reasons to be excited. But it just, it, I, I, no one really knows. Is it a free agent signing? Is it a trade? Is it some younger players? Some prospects, I mean. What fixes this team? Do you trade one of the core four guys? I don't know. Pros and cons and consequences to that? Is that an overcorrection? Is that an overreaction? Nobody really knows what the right thing to do is. It's just it keeps coming back to the same thing over and over and over again for the last three seasons. If guys like Matthews and Marner aren't going to produce, they're not going to win. They're not going to win. And Tavares gets injured. Uh, that's not his fault. But it's just like no team that gets nothing from their three highest paid players, no matter what those three highest paid players are getting played, are getting paid. Like you, you, you like the, like the, the, the Islanders, you know, if they get nothing from Anders Lee, which they haven't, he's been injured, uh, Barzal as well. And a guy like Brock Nelson, do they win? More than likely not, you know, a team like the lightning. Okay. Uh, the Kucherov, Stamkos and Hedman, they get no goals from them. Do they win? I don't know, maybe Braden Point scores like 40 goals in the playoffs or something stupid like that. Maybe they do. I don't know. But 9 out of 10 teams aren't going to be able to survive their three highest paid players, no matter how much money they're making, not scoring. Right? Or, or only getting one goal between them in a seven-game series. And it's like you can look at the uh, the ands and the buts and the ifs and the whatevers. Um, the thing that burns me the most is that they can make some of uh, value free agent signings. They can make some smart trades, right? And the new acquisitions and the younger prospects, and they can be all playing well. Even Jack Campbell, uh, Matthews can win back-to-back -back Rocket Richard trophies. Marner can be top five in scoring again. No one will care. They'll wait for the first round, they'll ring the bell, and they'll wait for them to do it again. And it's just gonna be like, okay, October, no one cares. November, no one cares. December, no one cares. Uh... 
January, February, March, no one cares. April, I don't know when the playoffs start. Probably in April, though. I don't know, maybe it gets easier um, to have optimism for next season as actual news starts to trickle in and the team starts to kind of take shape. But right now, um, it's really just you guys that are making it fun to do these videos and stuff like that. No, I, no, no, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be that dramatic. I'm having fun still, right? Um, it's just sometimes it's hard to know what to say <laughs> when, when it, when it really doesn't seem uh, to not matter if uh, these two guys aren't going to show up when it matters the most.